<laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thanks y'all for getting together this evening when it's like prime time for everything in farmer world. So I really appreciate everyone's time um, and sharing any kind of resources and just touching base with each other. Since we're such a small group, I'd also think it'd be cool if everyone could do some introductions of just where you're at and your farm location. Um, anything else that you want to share, maybe whatever you're interested in um, touching base on today about. Um, but then we'll kind of kick it over to Holly and Mark. So Holly was with Against the Grain Farm in Watauga County and Mark is with Mighty Gnome Market Garden in Haywood County. Um, so that's really cool to get a couple to get some space between y'all and, and hear about your experiences. Um, so I'll let y'all introduce yourselves and your farm a little bit more in your CSA style um, and get into it. And we wanted to talk about CSA accessibility as this like final CSA working group topic of the year because that's been such a hot topic and especially like true CSA accessibility. So like an actual a, profitable business model that makes it possible to create access. I think that's been the sticking point of what people feel is inaccessible is that they're like, sure, I can do a CSA and I can partner with people and give food away, but um, that's not really working with what a CSA model is supposed to be doing for me. So it's really neat to just hear about how folks have been able to make that work and what it took to get there. Um, so I can't wait to get into that conversation, but yeah, if we want to do a quick round of introductions about where everyone's coming from and anything you want to learn about today. Um, and I'm of course Larissa, I'm with ASAP, Program Coordinator. Um, I want to hear whatever uh, this conversation takes us, so definitely want to hear about accessibility. I get a lot of questions about it from farmers, um, about how folks are making this work, and I also hear from a lot of farmers who are trying a lot of new things out for the first time this year and are feeling like apprehensive and um, want to make sure that they're doing it, you know, the best way possible. So I want to be able to give them some tips and feedback about how that's going. Um, so that's kind of what I'm bringing with me today. And I'll kick it to Anna. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Anna and I also work um, at ASAP and I'm a program coordinator with the local food campaign and I work with farmers uh, helping them find market outlets and so I'm really interested to hear what the farmers here have to say about CSAs so thank you so much for for sharing and let's go to Matt or Chelsea next Hey, it's um, Chelsea and Kyle West. We're with Dirt Poor Farm in Sweetwater, Tennessee. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining us again. And Mary, do you want to introduce yourself? We can come back if Mary just stepped out for a second. Um, and then Holly and Mark, y'all will share a little bit more in depth about your uh, farm. So either one of you can take it away, whoever wants to kick it off. <laughs> Mark looks jazz. I almost want to volunteer him. <laughs> uh, cool. If that's okay with you, Holly. Uh, yeah. So my name is Mark. Uh, I'm one of two people that runs Mighty No Market Garden in Haywood County. We're just north of Waynesville, about 20 minutes from downtown Waynesville. Um, which like for me that feels very like urban farm but not not really the case in reality um but we have a 45 person csa currently um through farmer what we call farmer selected shares or um we, we call it mighty market shares um, which is essentially just a gift card to our online shop um smaller price point uh gives people a little bit more flexibility with how they can order um, and yeah, aside from that, I guess the size of our farm is, uh, five and a half acres in total of land, but we really only grow on about one and a quarter acres of cultivation. Um, and that's, uh, vegetable production primarily, um, strawberries, uh, were a thing we had last year prior to our move, but we just got here about two months ago and it'll be a, be a little while till we probably, uh, incorporate them again but right now just 
vegetable farm, um, CSA model, also attending two farmers markets, um, and uh, have a few wholesale accounts when there's extra food. Uh, very flexible schedules schedules with those. But um, yeah, looking forward to the, to the discussion. So. Thanks, Mark. And Mary, we can circle back to you. We're just doing quick uh, introductions. Anything you want to share about your farm or who's joining you today? <laughs> hey, I'm Mary Carroll Dodd. And hey, buddy, this is Xander. My, he's a helper. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> but um, we have a one acre diversified um, mixed vegetable farm or certified organic in Black Mountain, North Carolina. We have a CSA, about 40 members and go to one market and a few restaurants. So I'll be in and out as I'm, I'm listening, but trying to get them in bed too. So yeah, my video off. That's I'm, I'll be listening in. Yeah, it's totally fine. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. And Holly. Hey, everybody. Um, I have like a little PowerPoint. Do you want me to just introduce myself now? Or do you want me to like kind of launch into like sharing about the our cost share approaches? Or what do you think is best, Larissa? Yeah, I think so. Since we've done everyone's interest, I think it'd be fine for okay. you to do it cool. and then uh, kick off whatever folks want to talk about. Cool, cool. Do I have screen sharing permission? Yep. Really wonderful question. I don't know, but I'm I can't know. believe I even know to ask that question. But I feel I, like life I is know, just I'm so, so caught off guard. <laughs> so zoomy lately that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make you a co-host, and then maybe that allows you to do it every day. Okay, cool. I'll give it a shot. Um. Yeah. All right. Can you guys see? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. Cool. So this is just a shot of our farm. Um, I'm Holly and my husband and I have against the grain. Uh, we cultivate right at two acres in Zionville, which is outside of Boone in Watauga County. Um, and yeah, we, it's all sort of intensive style market gardening. Um, mostly vegetables, we raise a little bit of uh, grass-fed beef and um, a little bit of pork. We've done more livestock in the past, but um, a transition to mostly vegetables. Uh, we are a full-time farm family and um, we make our, our income solely from the farm. This picture is a little dated. Um, it doesn't show all of our fields, but it just gives you an idea of what we're all about. We currently have um, four farmer's friend caterpillar tunnels, um, 125 feet long and two, uh, high tunnels, 30 by 72. So just as like a kind of snapshot of our farm, um, we hire usually a combination of full-time and part-time people every season. And, um, we've really been focusing in the last handful of three to four years of really trying to cultivate community on the farm. Um, just to kind of help like grease the wheels of work-life balance and you might hear the kids in the background and I might put my earphones in if um, I need to. So yeah, our veggie CSA in 2022, um, we'll have 100, and, we're shooting for about 120 members. Um, and uh, we started the CSA in 2016 with like 20 members. Um, and our CSA right now is about 25% of our gross income. We also do the farmer's market, which I have a note here is about 36%. Um, we do a year round market. Um, and then about 16% of our gross sales are to restaurants, about 13% to a local food hub. And then the rest is miscellaneous. This is a mat's um, bedtime. So everybody just came upstairs. Um, yeah, and we actually, we have a customized CSA as well, but different than Mighty Gnome though. I 
I like how they do it. It sounds a lot more simple. We use a software Harvey to customize our CSA, which I'm happy to share with anybody anytime about the ins and outs of the, all that. Um, oh, so I kind of, yep, here we go. Harvey software. Our main season is 20 weeks and our fall extension is about four weeks. We have about 50 members. And we tried a winter season, January, February of 2022. Though somehow I like lumped that in the 2021 season. Um, and that was just eight weeks. We had 30 members and it went great. The Farmer's Friend Caterpillar Tunnels are awesome. Um, we used to have PVC style Caterpillar Tunnels. Um, bad. <laughs> those are, we retired those, which is great. but the farmers friend caterpillar channels let us have a, a little winter csa and at this point we grow everything in our csa boxes though harvey has the ability and i'm sure um mark also could do this with his online store offer products from other farms we just haven't ventured out into that at this point so i don't know just to give folks a little overview of our model so our cost share um, history, we started it in 2017. So we used to be a part of a multi-farm CSA um, that was sort of umbrellaed under a nonprofit and they ran a cost share program. They partnered with, I think like, um, oh, like the health department and offered some shares at one point and like got some little local grants and offered some cost shares. And that was really cool. And, um, we started at our current farm place in 2012. So I forgot to mention that before, but we didn't start our CSA till 2016. But um, so in 2017, as the multi-farm CSA was kind of dissolving for lots of different reasons, we just really felt called to like continue that um, uh, initiative of cost shares. And so um, in 2017, we raised a little bit of money 2018 and 2019 a little more and then COVID happened in 2020 and um, it really sort of turned people on to um, you know food access and um, food like the integrity of local food I think right so we were able to raise more funds in 2020 like pretty easily and then in 2021 we had a more concerted effort to raise more, even more funds. And that's about our goal here for 2022 is to raise um, $8,500 for cost shares. So some things we've tried. Um, so before we had Harvey, the customization software, we had just a question on our, we used a Google form to sign up people for the CSA. And we just had a simple, would you like to contribute to the cost share? Um, and it was a required question. So sneakily you either had to say yes and like choose an amount or you had to say no thank you not at this time right so it was like people were sort of i mean not forced but we really encouraged people to look at it and think about it right um and so that's how we started it started out um and now we offer like what's called a one-time add-on through harvey you can just add so the thing about harvey is you can't really customize an amount like you could with the Google form, you just sign up for the CSA and you can add like, I think we have a 25, a 50, a hundred and a 200 option for a cost share. Um, but then there's a note, like if you'd like to donate more, just, you know, send the farm a check, but that never happens. So um, yeah, we have tried pizza parties in the past. So we have a little cob oven on the farm and we used to try to have a pizza party every May. That didn't work. Um, for a lot of reasons. One is that it was just way too insane. Um, I think two, like we partnered with like a local um, pizza joint and brewery in town and we would buy dough from them and they would donate beer. And like, we would, you know, host this like really awesome pizza party, but it just like people would come and they would want to pay for pizza, but we'd have all these people say, well, what if I just, you know, we'd say like, hey, 30 bucks to come to the party. And a lot of people would say, well, can I just pay what I can? And it's like, sure, but the point is a fundraiser. So for us and like our membership or like our customer base at the market, the pizza party thing just never clicked. I think it's possible that an event could click, but 
Um, we also just got to the place where it felt like it was so much work to put one of those on with like, you know, not a whole lot of um, sort of return. So last season um, in 2021, um, we tried a merchandise fundraiser um, and we worked with a local print shop and um, we hadn't really ever sold t-shirts or like gear, hats, whatever, tote bags before. So um, it was really cool and that we didn't have to like pre-buy all the gear and like make that investment and then have to like hold on to that while we sold it. So instead she had this kind of concept that she actually started during the, during the COVID situation to generate work for herself because she was a printer who relied a lot on festivals. So when festivals were no more um, during that time, she was fundraising for different organizations that like meant a lot to her or were special to her. And then this fundraising concept just sort of expanded. And so she was used to doing it and <clears throat> she would set up like a temporary page on her website and we chose designs and um, the basic blanks and she would put them all on her website and then we just blasted it out to email list and social media people would go to her website order and it was only open for like a very succinct period of time so like I think we did it for like eight or ten days or something like that so people ordered and then it closed and then she immediately ordered all the blanks she needed printed everything and then she had like a system where she shipped them out or people could choose to pick up at the farmer's market if they wanted to so that worked pretty well I think we raised about a thousand dollars that way um which was cool I, we won't do that again this year because it's kind of weird to sell t-shirts every year um when your friends and family have already kind of done it once but um might be something we do like if we ever rebrand or something like that maybe we would revisit that um, and then uh, in 2021, for the first time, we try to go fund me um, and we're trying something called Give Butter this year, which is like GoFundMe. It's a platform, like a fundraising platform, but you can collect a little bit more information on people. GoFundMe, we didn't really like because um, you couldn't collect people's like email addresses or, or addresses. And um, we have a friend of the farm who has done some fundraising professionally, and she really recommended for your big funders, like, sit down and write them a thank you note, you know, that that's like really helpful. Um, and, you know, that's something that's probably really well known in the nonprofit world, and it's really well known in just like the courteous life world, but not super well known in the farmer world where you're just like trying to make it. Um, so, so we were kind of bummed with the GoFundMe that we really didn't have a way to like reach back out to people who had donated. So we're trying Give Butter this year. So I should back up and say in 2020, you know, people really gave, like we had a big jump in from like around $21, $2,200 toward our cost share fund to about $4,000. So at that 2020 mark, we had only before that done some kind of flat pizza parties and um, just the donate when you sign up for the share, right? And so in 2020, more people donated when they signed up for the share because there was just this feeling of like wanting to help and, you know, like empathy for your neighbor. So that was cool. And then also there was somebody through another partner that I'll talk about in a minute who just was like, here's $2,000 from a local building company that wants to have their like dollars mean something in local food. And so we thought of you guys because you have a cost share program. So we just like landed, it just doubled um, our cost share fund pretty quickly um, without the pizza party in 2020 because of COVID. So that really then inspired in 2021, like to think about alternative ways to raise money beyond the pizza party. Um, and so the GoFundMe happened and I ended up contacting the university. I'm like totally not into social media, disclaimer. Um, I just do it because I feel like it's like the way people communicate and the way people will know about the farm. And I was totally intimidated by the GoFundMe thing. And so there was, um, there's, I have a contact at the local university, Appalachian State, and I reached out to them um, and their sustainable development department. And they had some students that were doing capstone projects and she just pitched the idea and somebody was like, I wanna help with that. 
So a student helped set up the GoFundMe and help like draft some of the emails that we sent out to the newsletter with the GoFundMe link. So that was kind of helpful for me to just to get over that hump of like um, trying to think about, you know, raising money when it's just really not what I love to do. Like, I don't want to sell ice to an Eskimo, right? Like, that's just not my thing. And for some people, they're totally into it. Um, so we do have some community partners that have really helped in this endeavor. And so I mentioned Farm Cafe before, and it's a donation-based cafe. It's a really amazing model. It's right in Boone. They're a nonprofit and they get a lot of grants um, and private donations, but they facilitated that $2,000 contribution in 2020, which kind of kicked us over this hump of uh, pizza parties aren't working. We don't know what else to do. Um, and then places that we have distributed the cost shares. Um, so Ivy Terrace Apartments, it's, it's an apartment complex in town. My mom and my sister live there and um, they just help us kind of like vet potential members and help us distribute shares because, you know, one of the things that is, has been a challenge for us is like, you know, local food sometimes, like there's all these hurdles around it for, for some folks, like how to prepare it, how to eat it, like, you know, what does it taste like? I've never seen this before or whatever. And so um, really finding members who are gonna actually really utilize the produce and, and um, you know, actually cook, which some people just don't really cook very much. Um, so that's been really helpful to have some partners at Ivy Terrace and also the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church. Um, they've received four shares since 2020 and a friend of the farm had a contact there. And so we were able to um, get four shares to them, which has been pretty great. And, um, and then the second harvest food bank. So this is something totally separate than our fundraising, but they have an initiative to get local food. And I think a lot of this has happened since 2020, but they have an initiative to get local food out um, into communities more. And so they actually bought, bought 20 shares from us in 2021 and they're buying 20 shares from us in 2022. And then they have partnered with the Hunger and Health Coalition, which is another local nonprofit, and we'll just take our shares there. So the Second Harvest Food Bank is a cool partner, but really they're just buying shares from us and we're taking them to Hunger and Health. We don't really have anything to do with those 20 shares in terms of like raising the funds or finding the members. Um, yeah, but just a couple other things. This is my last so slide. Like just a few other things that I feel like are super important to think about when you're thinking about um, like offering cost shares for your CSA is, um, you know, that for-profit farms, different than nonprofit farms, neither one is like better or worse, but for-profit farms just really shouldn't absorb the cost of cost shares. Like, you know, if you look at our tax return, it's like, you know, we, we can qualify for um, some social programs. So like, we might be in that bracket of food insecure if we weren't farmers. We're not food insecure by any stretch, but just for me, it's like, I don't feel like it should be on my back to carry the weight of the expense, whether it's time and energy or funds to fully absorb the cost of cost shares. So it's just something to like keep in mind. And, you know, fundraising takes time, whether it's throwing a pizza party or doing a GoFundMe, and we feel like, so now that we have Harvey, Harvey offers this thing called um, auto renew, which is good and bad, but um, it automatically, if you're signed up for it as a member, it just automatically renews your membership. And I send out like three emails prior to that auto renew date, just so members are like fully clear that it's gonna happen. It's hard for them to miss the email. So I have to draft some emails and right away out of the, you know, 100 and so members that we had last year, 70 auto renewed right away. Like, so with three emails and that auto renew rollover, you know, we secured 70 paid shares, full, full paying shares. Um, but for me, like, this is just back of the napkin in my head. Okay, I'm like drafting the give butter, I'm drafting emails to potential CSA members who have given in the past. And I'm like, you know, creating a, a marketing campaign in a way that was fundraising. Um, and so that amount of work is about the same for those 10 cost shares 
as it is for me and my 70 paid shares that auto renew. Now I haven't filled my CSA with those 70, but just for some equation in my mind to think, okay, so these cost share shares are, if, the, if my farm is not gonna absorb the, the full spectrum cost of the cost shares, like I have to think about that when I'm factoring how much money I actually put toward each cost share, it needs to be more than I'm putting toward a regular share. Um, yeah, and in addition to that, for us personally in our farm and the way our cost share works, and I don't mean the 20 shares that we just drop second harvest to health and hunger. Like I'm not talking about those shares. Those shares are easy. I don't have to do any fundraising for that. I'm just talking about the shares that I fundraise for. And there's extra management, communication and delivery. So frequently with the cost share members, like I'm having to set up their accounts for them. And oftentimes I'm having to, so Harvey's has customizable shares. So I'm like making swaps for them or um, I'm helping them add extras, like there's emails back and forth, not every week, but pretty regularly. Um, and then for two, for uh, our two cost share sites, we deliver to those sites. Now we don't stand there, it's like a drop off because we have a, a point of contact there. So we deliver, but it is sort of extra and above. And so we have to factor that in when thinking about how much they're really worth. And it's to say all of this is worth it to us because we just really believe that good food, you know, is a basic human right. Um, and it's super important to us um, that, that it gets out there. Um, but I will say in a way, the flip side of this customizable CSA coin is it, is it does make cost shares like more accessible to the members because that has been a hurdle in the past for people being like, I don't, you know, I don't have time to watch a video on how to cook kohlrabi. Like that's not in the wheelhouse of my capacity in my life. And then it just, that kohlrabi just goes to waste, right? For example, but with a customizable CSA and a little bit of help from the farmer to like help them swap, you know, some folks don't have internet access. So like that's, that's a deal. Um, so with a customizable CSA, we know the members are like actually getting what they want and what they're gonna use, which is, um, I feel like helpful. So maybe that'll get the conversation started. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. That is A, precious. <laughs> and B, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, oh my gosh, that gave me so many ideas and questions and things that I'm thinking on. Um, and so I don't want to lose some of those. I'm going to share some of those things before I let Mark <laughs> go in on. Uh, but yeah, like the, I love that you mentioned like how the funder that was through another nonprofit you were working with knew that y'all had cost share available. So when the funding became available, they were like, oh, against the grain, plug it in. And I think like making it easy and making it known that it's available, like just having the option, whether you have the capacity to really like go after it is better than nothing. Like just having it be available for people to tap into. Because I think about, I work a lot with workplace CSAs and like connecting CSA farmers with workplaces. So I'm doing a lot of outreach all the time to workplaces to try and get them to sign up for a CSA share. And then when they say yes, I go to the farms that have, that demonstrate that they have like accessibility and that they're willing to deliver for this group of people and are gonna work for them, that they have all these options available. And if CSA farms didn't put it out there, like we're, it's just, you know, a possibility, then I would not even know to go there. Um, and then it makes me think of, and out of one of those workplace CSA connections, I connected uh, Encompass Farm with the YWCA of Asheville and speaking to accessibility. So the YWCA being a nonprofit and a workplace, they were like, well, we'll do the workplace for the staff, but also we're gonna write into grants to try and do some community shares. So they were able to do a workplace CSA and offer a few shares to community members um, because of that connection. So again, it was possible because Vanna from Encompass Farm was like readily available and I knew that her heart wasn't wanting to do this kind of thing. So she was top of my mind when it came time to do it. Um, and then vice versa, when folks are looking for farms, they wanna know like, where can I easily plug into? 
Um, but it makes me think too about your point on the extra management and communication that goes in with new CSA members, which is like a, of course, like this is people's, you know, first time doing this. Um, and I, everyone's frozen on my screen, so I can't tell if I'm frozen for y'all too. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but I was thinking like what also with my ASAP lens, like what could we be doing to support some of those pieces? So knowing that like every year, we are probably underestimating the number of folks that are coming on to CSA for the first time. And y'all know as well as we do the turnover rate, like how hard it is to retain CSA members. And so what does it look like for that burden to be not so much on farmers when there is like, if everyone's experiencing this retention issue because of under, lack of understanding or education around what your CSA is and how to flex your CSA, how to work in the Harvey system, which so many people already use. Like, what could it look like for Anna and I to create workshops or whatever, or do some like consulting for individuals that are um, needing to navigate a CSA for the first time? You know, we do it for people that are shopping at the farmer's market for the first time. And like, I'm always down to take people on tours, especially if it's like community members that are coming for the first time. Um, that's something that we make accessible to them. So I could see that translating into like making a CSA work for you and taking some of that off of farmers. Um, but yeah, it makes me think of a lot of really neat things. And I'm so happy that you shared like all the many ways that you've gone through it. And I can imagine that pizza party being a hot mess to put on, but like the most fun, <laughs> the most fun. And I'm jealous that I'm gonna miss it. Uh, for the pizza party, for the pizza party and the merchandise, I just wanted to double check that was all fully donated. So you didn't pay out of pocket for this, the shirts and for the pizza and the beer. Okay, so for the shirts, we didn't pay anything out of pocket. So the way she worked her fundraiser is like, it was all set up like I described. And then as people paid, she knew like what cut she needed to take. And then we had marked up the shirts and gear like above that so we just took a margin off of each thing cool. um whether it was a hat for, exactly yeah people yeah people paid and then people also just gave extra she had a way right there that people could just give extra um in that merchandise fundraiser so that was cool and sometimes people would just like pop a hundred bucks or you know like whatever extra 50 bucks extra 10 bucks that happened so that was cool no so for the pizza we did get dough donated and we got beer donated, but then like all the other ingredients and supplies, like the farm had to float. And that was tricky, you know? I mean, in the in those first couple of years, we, we sort of were just trying it because we thought we have this, you know, cob oven and it's like a way to get people to the farm and connect people to the farm. So we felt like it sort of had, you know, more, it was more than just a fundraiser. Like it was also just community connections. Yeah. Um, but it just also felt like people were like pizza, like it, it was too informal. It wasn't enough, like of like a fancy farm dinner, even though it was like <laughs> amazing pizza and like incredible yeah. ingredients and salad. And like, we, you know, we spent days like prepping and <clears throat> stuff, but, um, it just never really did what we wanted or like intended it to do. But in hindsight also, like it did build kind of like you know, people's understanding of what we were about and that like yeah. those connections around like just that we had a call share and that it was meaningful for us. So that was all positive, but just like we printed, you know, postcards to pass out of the market. Like we had to front all that cost. So um, there was definitely more overhead and then sort of like more to lose. Like if it was rainy and mm -hmm. people just didn't come out, you know? So, and who did end up coming then? Was it mostly people that you already knew and it was like a friends and family kind of thing? Or did you get a lot of folks that just knew you from the market or saw it on social media? Yeah, it was people, it was mostly people that already knew us, like good customers, family would come. Um, um, we had a connection with a group home that um, two adults, two homes for adults with disabilities right down the road from our farm. Um, and it was before we had the customizable CSA and that was really our main focus for our early cost shares because they were right here in our neighborhood. I didn't even list them in our community partners, but they were right here. And actually my sister lived there for a couple of years. And so I was trying to get some good food in her mouth and in her belly. Um, and so we 
we were really focused around raising cost shares for that specifically. And so we kind of targeted like the church that they attended to come and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then over time, we that was before we had the customizable CSA. We just realized like, man, they're not using a lot of the food. You know, they just like the staff just didn't know. And I didn't have the full capacity to like recipes. I mean, we did some recipes in our newsletter, but like getting the staff to read the newsletter, it just, there were so many hurdles, you know? Um, and so we just realized that a lot of it wasn't getting used. My sister has since left the group home and lives in an apartment in town, um, right down the row from my mom. So, um, now like my focus is there more, um, has been there more just, but yeah, but I think the customizable CSA could have made it more accessible for those folks potentially. Sweet. Thanks for sharing all that. Any other questions for Holly or ideas that came up on that? Um, yeah, I, I had a question. Um, so with your fundraising activities, uh, if you had more CSA signups, would that would that mean that you would have to fundraise less or does it not really matter how many signups you have? It's still something that you want to do or need to do. I mean, not want, but you know, something. I'm, I'm just not sure how that works. Yeah, like how we calculate how many cost shares we want to take on is that. I guess so. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, are you just looking more for potential, just more CSA signups and what's your capacity? What's your limit for that? And then how do you, um, I guess then you calculate the fundraising. Yeah, totally. So the cost of our CSA shares have, has really gone up over time um, because mostly the Harvey software is, you know, they take 10%. And so we factor that in and we like add a, a packing and handling fee on all of our shares just right on the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so that alone has made the cost shares more Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that, just all the factors that I mentioned of like more effort. And so it feels like for us right around that, that 10 number. And so when we fundraise, we're fundraising for them to receive it main season, fall season and winter season. So that's part of that too. It's not just, um, 10 main season shares, but, um, yeah, for us, that feels just like a nice sweet spot, um, like trying to fundraise more would be potentially over my head and put me just in a whole new category. I mean, just fundraising a couple thousand dollars early on felt like, okay, I can do this, you know, and then like learning a little bit about the social media sort of platform, GoFundMe sort of style. It's like now we've like gained momentum where people know about us and uh, you know, community members, farmers market customers, CSA members like know about us. And so it's a little more accessible to just plug in and, um, and, you know, raise, raise more funds uh, through those social platforms. So it's just kind of, we've just found a balance. I think <laughs> I wouldn't want to try to raise much more than 85 to like maybe $10,000. And that's a lot of money for just like, a little farmer to try to raise, you know, um, without a lot of fundraising experience or training. So that feels like a sweet spot to me. And it hasn't been so much to just like finish filling our CSA. It's more just because we really want to mm -hmm. have cost shares, you know, so it's, it's some of both, but trying to have more than that feels like over my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad that when my internet crashed, y'all kept going, <laughs> but that was me popping in and out. Um, all right, cool. Well, I'm gonna kick it over to Mark to share a little bit about Mighty Gnome. Um, oh, Mary's got a question before we go to Mark. Does everyone sign up through Harvey, Holly? Yes, everyone signs up through Harvey. And the way I sign up our cost share members is, um, I give them a coupon or lots of times I actually just end up signing them up with a coupon so I can track from the back end exactly um, what I've what 
what cost your members have paid to join. And I frequently sign them up though. Occasionally they'll do the sign up, but yeah, they do sign up through Harvey and that way I generate them a label um, and they can make swaps if they have that capacity. Um, but the other nice thing about Harvey, and this would probably also work for Mark, but um, with his online store model, but I can like, if I have extra money, but it's not really enough money for a share, I can just give everybody that's a cost share member $25 worth of credit um, or, you know, $35 worth of credit for adding extras to their share. So that's kind of nice um, in that there's like a little buffer if I have extra funds. And there's Is it all 100% mm -hmm. donated to them or do they pay a portion? So we used to do like some partial, like some half price shares and, um, and now we just do 100% cost shares. Um, so yeah, we don't, and we don't have any sort of process of like, tell, I mean, we just feel like we, we don't want to like shame people or have people like show us any of their personal information. So for us, it's just like, if there's a relationship and there is an interest, then we offer people a cost share and we just have relationships with people and connections that we don't like check anybody's whatever financial status. So was the decision to do only a hundred percent just because it was easier and because you were like, I don't really want to get into who deserves 50 and who deserves a hundred percent. Yeah, that was a part of it. We did have a cost share member for a couple of years who had been a cost share member through our multi-farm CSA. Um, and she liked to pick up at the high country food hub. Um, and they had the ability to let her swipe her EBT card weekly. And she was really good about coming weekly. Um, and so, because that had been a challenge with the multi-farm CSA, the multi-farm CSA was able to take the EBT swipe. So they would raise funds for the cost share members and their funds that they raised would pay half the cost of the share. And then the member would pay the other half with their EBT card when they picked up. But we were having issues with the multi-farm CSA of people not showing up, not picking up, um, you know, forgetting, and then the box was there the multi-farm CSA bank had already paid the farmers or was expected to pay the farmers for the produce. And half of that produce had been paid for by the, by the grant, but the other half maybe wasn't getting covered by that EBT swipe. And that was causing issues. And so we had sort of taken this cost share member on when the multi-farm faded away and she was a really great customer. So it wasn't a problem. And she swiped her EBT card weekly at the food hub they had the capacity to take that and then we covered the other half of her share and that works for sure if you have that relationship and like you you feel really confident that that's going to come in um but asking people that potentially are food insecure or have limited access to financial resources to pay half up front is like also just doesn't feel fair or like doesn't feel like it's really contributing to you know food equality so um yeah this was just the way we said okay we're just going to pay the full cost of the share and that felt good but yeah yeah thanks for sharing that a lot of folks have questions about how to do snap for csa and holly knows this asap was looking into this forever <laughs> we were really trying to make this happen and i just think it's you can't do like a fundamental traditional CSA with SNAP. So with SNAP, you have to receive the produce within two weeks of swiping of like spending the money. Um, so of course you couldn't do a traditional CSA. You could do like a week by week paying it off kind of thing. Uh, but then at that point you get more bang for your buck and less headache for the farmer if you just come to a farmer's market and use your SNAP redemption that way. And then you can pick whatever you want and farmers don't have to box up your stuff. So. We've kind of been encouraging folks to just kind of go that route. Recently, um, it changed so that there's more um, accessibility around online SNAP sales. So now farmers can also take SNAP for their online markets, um, which is really neat. And that is like moving the needle forward. But I think it's not necessarily like a traditional CSA model to do it that way. But it's cool that it exists. And we'll definitely promote that that's a thing that folks can, can get into. Holly, I was, did you, what's that? 
Go ahead, Mark. Oh, <laughs> I was wondering, Holly, did you say you went to a farmer's market or I'm sorry if I missed that. Was yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we do uh, a year round market. It's actually run by two different organizations, but um, yeah, we go to a farmer's market year round. I was just wondering, cause I, I was kind of in the same place where we were kind of thinking, you know, like how do we, we're not very good at fundraising or I guess we haven't, uh, we don't have a lot of experience uh, doing it. I don't know if we're good at it. Um, and I was just wondering for this year, for one thing we were thinking of doing for like a cost share or like a, uh, you know, to spend a little more to, you know, to help somebody else out or to do a cost share for somebody else. We were thinking about just doing an add on almost like a tip based um, situation at the farmer's market. And I didn't know if like, I don't know if I want to do that for every single customer or just kind of have a jar or I don't know like the best way to advertise that or to go about doing that without, um, you know, having it be uh, a negative experience for the, sh the customer. But we, we see a lot of people and usually they have a little extra money to spend at the markets we go to. So we were just kind of thinking of that as a potential way to raise some money to spread around some more food to people who maybe wouldn't have access to it um otherwise but yeah i was just wondering if that was something you you've thought about doing or um maybe you went against it or um yeah just any yeah thought. that's a great idea we did some merchandise a few years before we did that merchandise fundraiser but we pre-bought some shirts and produce bags and some things like that and sold that and that was kind of our way to say hey this is you know all the proceeds from the this gear will go toward um the cost share fund and that was a challenge we ended up just with i feel like some gear that we ended up giving away to family but it was hard to like put that out at the market for us personally and like have the room as our booth got fuller and like clearly display it and track it so i love the idea of like you know something that our little local food um health food store does is they have like a rounding up program and i think it would be hard to do unless you had square and i don't know if square has this feature but just a way to round up like hey do you want to round up you know for our cost share fund that could be cool and if you had a point of sale that could do that um that would make it easy to track um and for sure i mean just put a jar out you know and then you could make signs like round up for the cost share fund and you know you don't have to like ask every person but you know maybe you like you just put signs out and people people catch on yeah i think you're right i mean it was cool to see it quantified that like when covid hit i felt like every customer that we had uh built a networking relationship with or like had like subscribed to the newsletter or a returning csa member like specifically like the amount of interest there is right now to give a little more just because people have a little more and you know we're still still coming out of a pandemic um like it was i mean without doing any work uh in terms of marketing any of these programs like people were expressing that interest um pretty pretty frequently um so yeah i, I don't know how to i'm glad you uh shared all those ways that you've done it in the past to, to raise some funds because i was scratching my head on how how it would be best to do it um because right now we just we mainly rely on like a weekly newsletter to our current csa members which um has has always been the strongest because of our workplace csa with the city of Asheville. because i feel like uh you already kind of have that built-in sense of community within a workplace hopefully if, if you like the people you work with and uh from there it was always kind of easier to branch off and uh yeah, I don't know. It's just like I, I it's a, such a tricky thing to ask people for money, I think. Um, and it's yeah, hard. it is, but it's like for a really good thing. So, you, you know, if you have workplace CSAs, I mean, that feels like potentially a great avenue to like just check in with your contact at the workplace CSA. And maybe that's one thing that ASAP, like this is just coming to me, that ASAP could do is be the nonprofit if somebody wants to like like donate a bunch of money to mark csa for cost share funds but wants it to be tax deductible so that's something that we have encountered in the past um somebody last year and they want to give us some funds again this year they want to give us two thousand dollars um but they want to run it through a place you know so they can have a tax deduction and so, you know, your workplace, like, 
somebody at the workplace, somebody in HR ought to run the fundraiser, you know, for your cost share fund. And if they want to be able to donate it and get tax write-offs for everybody, they should be able to, they, it would be really cool if they donated it to ASAP and then ASAP gave you the funds. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just a brainstorm. Uh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like the, the biggest success we've had of building our CSA is putting our members like kind of to work for us. Um, you know, like just like logistically, like how hard it can be to drop off CSA shares at a certain place. So with the workplace, it was always at City Hall. It was always at City of Asheville. And then as soon as COVID hit, like we immediately started asking people to become site host, which gives them a little bit more responsibility, um, puts them in charge of like, did everyone pick up? You know, if they didn't pick up, what are our rules for that? Contacting people and actually like essentially building that sense of, you know, actual community um, other than just like buying a product from a local farm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've always found that's like the most successful when we can actually build that network and um, actually build the business around that CSA model um, from the very beginning. And yeah, it, I'm excited to see people starting to think about how we can go beyond other than just like, you know, having it at the workplace, but like also helping those that maybe otherwise will never have, wouldn't have access to the CSA or couldn't make the farmer's market on Saturday morning. Totally. Or even just a simple email to your site host saying like, is anybody interested? Like if you feel intimidated to like do a GoFundMe or do a, you know, some sort of social media fundraiser, um, maybe somebody, you know, I mean, people have awesome skills and experience that you don't know about unless you ask. And so um, maybe even just an email out to your site host saying like, we're looking for some support on this and just curious if anybody has any experience or has any connections and would want to, you know, contribute to raising some funds for our call share program. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like it is always worth asking. And especially if you're working with um, a workplace that is also a nonprofit, again, back to the YW, like Dr. Lavender at the YW could not stress it enough. She was like, let us know all the wildest dreams that all everyone has because we're writing grants all day, every day. So if your workplace CSA is with a nonprofit specifically, like you can really cultivate that relationship and you can get worked into a lot of their grants and like put local food up front of their mind for the kind of work that they're doing. Um, and then with the city, it might be a little bit trickier because there's a lot of levels to it, but the sustainability office is where a couple of folks from the sustainability office I know are in that workplace CSA. And they obviously are leveraging funds, you know, in the realm of sustainability and what could that look like? And I think maybe, you know, they would be open to probably some of those creative conversations about like, this is how you could promote, you know, farmers on Earth Day, because I know you're going to be doing that anyway. And, you know, just like keep plugging yourself like that. So that's a really good point. And yeah. Mark, can you talk a little bit more about how y'all have navigated some like all of your delivery and drop offs and pickups and stuff over time for folks? Because I feel like you've definitely created a lot of accessibility around that. And I want to know how that's all been working out for you. Yeah, we try to. So we, we used to use a software called Farmigo. Um, I, it was a little too expensive, I think, for, for what it was, but it did kind of give us the idea of just like, um, I, I think just having a software in place where like your logistics can kind of be like in front of you, uh, what, at least once you get above, for us, it was like over 20 members, everything got pretty confusing pretty quickly when they were on different days of the week on different set schedules for the CSA. Um, but essentially, yeah, we, between site host and um, relationships with just local businesses, we essentially try to create um, two drop-off days every week. So there's a, a Wednesday, a Thursday, and then also available at the farm um, and at market. Um, but essentially it's just um, a square sign up. So all through a web store, have everyone enter their, their information for how they can co contact you and um, how they wanna pay you and essentially just pick up a pickup location and they get automated emails saying like your share will be ready, uh, you know, this upcoming Wednesday at this location. Um, we unfortunately don't have a contact information for like someone who would be at the business. You'd probably like 
usually we drop off at breweries so you'd probably go ask the, the bartender which i'm sure they don't love but thankfully most people will pick up the uh outside we have a little cooler with some ice packs and the relationship is essentially just like at the end of the day the business will take that cooler and, and stash it away for us um it's always a little easier for us to work again with those site hosts just because like most people have friends picking up at their front porch um and it's pretty pretty straightforward where like if they miss their share it's not so cutthroat where it's like you don't get your share now because you know your car broke down and you're an hour late it's usually like they put it inside and they can go pick it up either tomorrow or a little later. Um, but yeah, we offer, try to offer at least always one more day other than the farmer's market. Cause I always felt like if I wasn't a farmer, I probably wouldn't make it to the farmer's market on Saturday morning. Um, so it always felt hard for me to sell something where it was like, you can pick it up between nine and 12 on Saturday morning for 20 straight weeks. <laughs> um, so yeah, Wednesday and Thursday worked out the best for us logistically, just with how we harvest and how we pack. Um, but yeah, outside of that, um, having a walk-in cooler at the farm with a little checkoff list is really useful too. Um, but coolers work pretty well too if you invest in a, a nice enough one with some ice packs. They'll they'll hold for for plenty of time between however long the window is you need them to pick up at whatever site. And with the city of Asheville, is it also like a cooler with an ice pack situation or I just imagine their facility is big enough that you would think they would have refrigerators and stuff available. They don't have refrigerators. So it'd be right. At, it's right through security. Right. When you walk in um, it's air conditioned, like unbelievably like yeah. <laughs> much. So it feels like a walk-in cooler. Um, but essentially when COVID hit, they kind of shut that whole no access for pretty much like anyone. Um, so then that, that became that the site host thing all over again but we essentially would just roll in about 25 shares um and then people would you know they have little key cards or whatever they whatever they need to pick up um that that business is kind of an intense workplace csa you know it's not like not like the breweries we've worked with in the past yeah. you have to go through like a metal detector to get it but um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean anything that's like shaded and cool I feel like it's pretty food safe for the however long the window is you need to have people pick up, um, but just having multiple options. So like, we'll go to like three or four site hosts and then a business, um, you know, all in that day. So, you know, hopefully you're getting someone, you know, within a mile from the drop off or, you know, within a few miles where it's not a huge inconvenience. Um, but yeah, it, as straightforward as possible and as like logistically easy, you know, as much of a straight line as we can get where we're not driving around for six hours. Yeah. A really cool model I heard of at one point was that people um, like getting deep freezes and putting a, like a, an override, I think Inkbird makes one that, where you can turn a, a deep freeze into uh, fridge. And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ben Hartman and the lean farm, but I think he does that for some of his, his drop, his remote, you know, or his drop sites. And it gives members flexibility. I don't know if it's in like one of his members garages or if it's at like a brewery or, you know, I don't really know any of the details, but I know I've heard him speak to that and, or maybe read about it. Um, and it gives people a little bit of a longer pickup window um, which is kind of nice, but you have to have somebody that's willing to plug it in for you and, you know, like pay the power. <laughs> yeah, we, we keep hope our walk-in cooler is on wheels right now. So we keep hoping that um, we'll, when we get another, a larger one for the farm that like we can have someone take advantage of like, we don't have anything to tow it with either is kind of the, the big thing, but like, it would be nice to have that be a drop-off site for, um, you know, a a food pantry or a local nonprofit nearby where it could be put to use. But um, yeah, those easily converted like walk-in coolers or like the deep freezes are pretty, pretty helpful for, for not a huge amount of money. Yeah, that's really cool. Holly, if you find any information about that, please share it and I can pass it on to folks. Um, Mary asked about how do you crop plan when you have a customizable CSA? Do you ever run out of things? 
I have ran out of things. I usually will plan for, uh, so if we had a 50 member CSA, I would plan for 150 people. And that's just based on uh, what I have been able to accomplish in the past of like, how many beds would that take? Um, unfortunately, sometimes that's like way more than I would like if I wasn't very good at growing something, you know, the prior year, I didn't have much success. I'm always trying to like get that number as low as possible. So it takes up less of the amount uh, of the available field. Um, but one thing that was nice with the software we've used in the past, which um, was a bright spot for Farm Go, is you could, uh, if they were going through the store to basically place their order, you could limit the quantity of something that someone would have or someone that someone could order. So if they're, if you only have, uh, let's just say 10 Brussels sprouts or whatever, 10 kale, uh, you can limit one per customer. Um, and thankfully, when you have like multiple days where, where people are ordering or people are picking up, um, we kind of stagger when the store will open. So like if you're picking up on uh, Wednesday, it'll open Monday, you know, for however long, like 12 hours or whatever we put that window. And then we can kind of go back out if we need to harvest more or if like maybe we feel like we can get a few more to kind of fulfill that order. The people that see the store open later that week either didn't know that kale wasn't, you know, like they don't feel like they were missing out on kale because they don't know it was there or you've limited it enough where people do get kale because you only let people order one each. Um, so you can kind of have a little flexibility with that. Uh, Farmigo was great for it, but again, it was a pretty expensive software. And uh, for Square, they don't let you limit the uh, quantity available per customer, just the, like, the stock number. So because of that, you know, we're hoping that we have grown enough of everything that was kind of a learning curve for us last year but um usually people are pretty pretty understanding i feel like most people that shop at the farmer's market get it you know that it's not an unlimited quantity of a hundred acre farm or whatever um but yeah definitely not not a great feeling when it happens so for harvey um it works a little bit differently than an online store so when we build our um, CSA <clears throat> delivery for that week, we just list what we have. So if we only have 30 bunches of beets, we just list 30 bunches of beets. Or, you know, if we only have 35 bunches of kale, that's what we list. And then the algorithm puts together based on what members listed their preferences as. So they, every member ranks every vegetable from a one to a five. Um, and then the Harvey algorithm takes what we list we have and it puts them in people's boxes according to their preferences. So in theory, if there's only like 10 Brussels sprouts say, um, then you know the member who didn't get them doesn't know that some members did, right? So then, but then when members can go in they have a customization period where they can go in and make swaps and add extras, they can see, okay, um, you know, there's extra kale this week, or there's extra radishes or extra turnips, I'll take them or I'll swap my Brussels sprouts out for those turnips. And then the Brussels sprouts appear and the next member that hops on can grab them. So that's kind of how it works. Supposedly the algorithm will take, you know, if you only have a limited quantity of something like 10 uh, Brussels sprouts, and there's 50 people that have listed it as a five, so they really like it and they would take it anytime you have it. The algorithm supposedly cycles through. So every time you list the Brussels sprouts, a different 10 people will get those Brussels sprouts. So it kind of spreads the love around in that way. Um, it's not a perfect system, but um, you know, that the, the issue we found is that, um, and specifically with like the 22nd Harvest Food Bank shares, they don't really do a lot of swapping and a lot of customizing. They just set their preferences early in the season. So they really like tomatoes and summer squash and you know all the like kind of more staples um, and onions and you know winter squash and things that are yeah just more commonly known. No arugula, no fennel. Like they listed those as like one. Like don't ever give them to me or I'm quitting. You know, and so that's been a challenge because then you know with something like cherry tomatoes, this came up multiple times last year. I just felt like we would list twenty pints. And time and time again, those 20 pints were going to the second harvest shares, 
because they just didn't have enough fives or fours or threes to cycle through other things that we had. So they kept getting those cherry tomatoes. So I'm working with Harvey to think about maybe actually having those 20 shares be a whole separate delivery where I can list the things that I want to go there. Definitely cherry tomatoes some, but not every week, week after week after week. I want to cycle those through to the other members. So there's some tweaks, but for us in crop planning and a customizable CSA, um, you know, we sort of come at it from another direction that says, or we kind of try to marry these two ideas of like, what are our customers, what are our members want? And also like, what does the farm do really well? And so if our CSA tends to have more things like lettuce and salad mix and sunflower shoots in it, because those are really like some economic foundations of the farm crops that really carry the farm, um, you know, and we have members that really want a lot more okra or things that we just don't grow or things that aren't profitable for us, that's okay if we lose those members and they find another CSA, like that's not the end of the world. We want members that really like what we grow um, and offering the customizable option, like we feel like gives people a lot of options, but we still can't be what we're not. And so for us, we're not trying to grow crops that like don't help carry the weight, their weight on the farm financially speaking. Um, and so, yeah, we don't, we haven't really shifted what we grow um, because we're able to kind of just list what we have in our, in our CSA. I guess the other thing, and maybe it's like, it goes without saying is like our, our CSA takes the top priority before wholesale accounts or farmer's market accounts too. So like usually like we are growing enough because we want to make very sure that we're fulfilling those CSA orders. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll handle our, our other accounts, like stuff that makes it to the farmer's market has gone through every, every other offer pretty much that we have. Um, and, and thankfully it's enough to, to stock the booth, you know, pretty, pretty well to do sales. But, um, like if someone pays me money up front to be part of a CSA, like they, they are getting the freshest, you know, the, the best, best food available, which is like why I'm, I'm also another reason why I'm drawn to that cost share model for the CSA is like, I feel like a lot of the times, like the food that'll make it to like a food pantry or, um, you know, anything that gets donated by or given to the gleaners, I feel like it's, it's sat out at market for like four and a half hours. Um, you know, it's fine quality at the start of the day, but maybe not by the time it actually reaches its destination. Um, and it just, it's nice to uh, be able to actually pick out some of those prime, you know, the ones that you know, look fantastic and like are going to someone who's already paid for it. And it, I don't know, it, there's, it's one thing to get uh, food from a local farm at like 8 a.m. <laughs> at the market and then like at 1 p.m. Um, so it, it's nice to be able to, to treat those members like that because you know, they, they deserve it. I love that you say that, Mark. I feel the same way. And like the data shows food insecure folks are at risk of so much like diet related illness at such a higher scale than folks that are not and and mental illness too like that's all correlated and so it's makes a really big difference the quality of the food and not just and then of course that it's local and that you know we can support this economy mm -hmm. mary asked how does the CSA coupon in quotes work through square i use it for our online store but have not explored it with the CSA I believe if I have it correct, I believe that our coupon, everything goes through the store essentially. Um, so it's not like they'd be getting charged each week or anything like that. So like city of Asheville offers a payroll deduction program. That's like kind of another nice perk of the workplace CSA is like, instead of just, I mean, I, I don't, often don't have $500 to go buy a CSA share. Um, but I would rather have it taken out of my paycheck slowly for the next however many weeks. Um, so I believe, I believe what we did for ours is just, a, it's a coupon code. It would be a hundred percent discount for those people. Um, so you just type in whatever the code is, it gets knocked off and then the payment would actually be handled through the workplace. Um, other than that, like, I don't, 
you know, for other people that sign up for the CSA, uh, the customize, you know, the customizable one would all be through the store. Uh, the people that wanted like the farmer selected CSA, I don't believe we have any coupons available to them at the moment. Um, it would essentially be, I, I need to know where they're picking up, which is what they do when they sign up and uh, basically just a, a way to contact them. So I don't believe um, unless I'm misinterpreting the question, I don't. I don't think we have a use for the coupon for uh, the full full time members. So, but do they um, do they choose what they're going to get through the online store for their CSA box? So, our farmer selected shares. They we basically pick everything out for them, and then the so the I guess for the workplace CSA they have to go through. Uh, they have to be over a certain amount to qualify for payroll deduction, and it's usually over $400. Um, so anyone that's doing Farmer Selected isn't going to the store. They don't like customizing it more often than not, but they would have the option to go ahead and place an order, but it would be separate from their total. So they basically, like, we would give them an email saying, like, this is what's in your box this week. And then if they wanted to, while the store is open, like anyone else, they could go buy some additional stuff, um, but it would be charged per order for them. Um, for people that have like a gift card, uh, it would just come out of that balance, which is essentially how we use our customizable CSA. If that, did that answer it? Sorry. For yeah, so they, so you set up, I've never, I haven't ever explored the gift card through the online store. So you set up, a, if they pay $500, um up front in the spring and then they so they would have five hundred dollars to use throughout the season but they would use their gift card code every time they went through the through the online store so if someone wanted to pay five hundred dollars uh they would either have to just buy a gift card and we would get five hundred dollars and then essentially the gift card is basically available for online shopping and it would be a code yeah i think it's like um I believe what happens is they get like a five digit code to enter for their card and that balance just slowly runs out and they can track it as the season progresses. Um, if it was something where they didn't want to customize it um, in, in most instances, I would go through the workplace CSA. So they would just say like, yes, I sign up and then payroll would handle that um, on the workplace end and they just pay us up front later. And it, you know, it, we keep track of how many weeks they've gotten deliveries essentially. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that answered it. And the, the, the city of Asheville's payroll deduction program is very unique. Like I have not come across another one like that in our region. And um, I think about four, we just spoke to them recently. I think four folks are taking them up on the payroll deduction, but not that's four out of maybe like 20 folks that are in the program. About, um, yeah. And they were able to work it out with HR. And it was a super complicated way to do it initially. And, but now that they have it, they are like happy to consult with other workplaces. I had them touch base with the city of Hendersonville the other day, and they were happy to like meet and talk through how they made that process work because it can get sticky to do payroll deductions um, for, you know, like HR legal reasons and all that. So if anyone is doing a workplace CSA and their workplace, they wanna maybe incentivize through um, that payroll deduction, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can put you in touch with City of Nashville folks to talk you through how that's working. Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, Mary, just to like follow back up, like Squarespace this year is our. We were at Farmigo last year. Uh, we after like kind of messing around with it quite a lot, we found that like it felt like the gift card approach, though it's like kind of silly to have someone buy a gift card when they're like trying to sign up for a customizable CSA. I felt like it gave us by far the most flexibility in terms of like uh just, just how that program how that software is designed it felt like it was the most flexible and easiest for people to use through the store without over complicating it um by saying like customizable csa like there was no way to just give them a balance in their store account that they could slowly run out like it had to be through a gift card um which is probably something they'll fix like i feel like that would be really convenient if it didn't have to be a gift card um but at the same time it was really nice because people did gift each other um, gift cards. <laughs> so it is, it is nice on that, on that side to be able to just as easily send it to someone else. But um, 
if you find a better better approach, please let me know because we searched for a while. <laughs> so this is square space, not square. That you're sorry, using. that's the confusion. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Squarespace is our website. Okay, oh, okay. You know I mean? Yes. Square. I've used square and it just doesn't seem to have a lot of options. So um okay, so you you have a website that you like pay a monthly fee through Squarespace. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I cool. that now I get it. Yeah, Squarespace is our like our domain, like our domain, I don't know, host. Um, and it has an online shop in it. I okay, believe gotcha. they partner, you can like link up Square to it. So you can like track your inventory and like set up your store that way. But Squarespace is where we are selling those gift cards, if that makes sense. And then your online store is through Square? It's like they need like a processor, you know what I mean? So okay. like you, you okay, gotcha. Square device to it. Um, okay. but like specifically like Squarespace domain is selling gift cards for people to use. So sorry for the confusion there. Any other questions or ideas before we wrap up? Um, that, com that community and action uh grant uh, that'd be something to keep an eye out for for future projects i don't know if anyone wants to speak on that that was an asap yeah. uh, <laughs> asap program yeah so we just uh closed out like the first round of applications and we still have some that are trickling in and we'll take a look at those we haven't like closed down the application yet but Community in Action is basically our attempt at trying to see what all the cool projects are that are going on or that people want to get into at the intersection of local food and health. Um, because we're kind of starting off all these Farm Fresh for Health initiatives, including workplace wellness programs and our produce prescription program. But we were like, this ain't it. Like there's way better ideas out there. People are doing really cool things and we want to fuel all of those projects. So we kind of put out this uh, request for applications to get a sense for what was out in the field and got some really cool things back. And it's uh, neat to see, and we got it from all across the region. So it's really neat to see what people are doing. And we got it from community organizations, from farms, from farmers markets, from churches, from social service agencies, um, cooperative extension, just a whole bunch of cool stuff. And so now we're kind of on the back end, putting the pieces together of mapping all this out and getting resources out to projects that could collaborate with with each other. So we have like farms, let's say in Clay County who are like, we'd love to do something, but we don't have a, a good community partner. We don't have like the health angle. And then we have a physician from Clay County applying and they're like, we want to do something, but we don't know any farms and, you know, being able to mash them up and then feel, feel out what resources they need, um, whether it be funding or technical assistance and um, ASAP is always down to, to support with like promo and educational materials about all these things. So to Holly's point earlier about recipes, you're like, yeah, I get some recipes out there, but I can't keep up with that all the time. We, you know, are, have endless recipes that we could create and print. So like things like that to support people's projects or um, events that people want to put on, uh, farm tour things that they would like to do and host folks on the farm and like what kind of support they would need for that. So we're kind of looking for all those pieces on the back end. And then of course, that's a big piece of like where CSA accessibility can come out of that too. We've seen a lot of projects that people are trying to do this exact thing. They're like, we want this to be profitable and work within our existing business plan, but we want to feed people. <laughs> we want to feed the community and we want to see where that, how that can really function. And it's going to take a coalition of partners. It's going to take for-profit businesses, farms, nonprofits that can write grants, uh, farmers markets that can rally a whole bunch of community people to do the one-off donations when they come to the market. You know, it's going to look like a mix of things. Um, so that's kind of this like now master puzzle and piece of yeah, putting all those things together and seeing what comes out of it. So looking forward to dive into that more to come for sure. And we'll be convening all those folks over the year and um, yeah, just like keep having these conversations about how to partner with one another because accessibility can't happen 
because of just us. Like, it, we're, like a farmer is not going to be able to create accessibility and address like food equality and food access. It's going to take you know a coalition collaborative of folks. So we want to keep that momentum going and not put the burden on any one person because it's not. Um, it's not a burden at all, you know, it's only feels that way if you feel like no one's out there to support you, but that's not the case. So much more to come on that. So I'll circle back with all of y'all for sure. Um, I'm also going to research what point of sale system can do the rounding up at markets and do some recon on which ones are available and maybe do some how to's if, uh, if it's easy enough, because that was a really great like easy enough thing and whether it's raising money for CSAs or something else that folks have going on like farmers should be empowered to be able to do that just as easy as Whole Foods you know <laughs> so I'll check that out I'm going to look into what like fiscal sponsorship looks like for CSA shares whether it be individual farms or if we had like a pot of money that folks could put into um, for when someone wants to donate and have it be tax deductible so I can definitely see what what's in our realm of possibility. And then there's also some partners that we have in our network who are already fiscal sponsors for other folks. So that could be an avenue for sure. So really great ideas. I'm glad that y'all are seeding it. And to Holly's point, if you don't ask, you won't receive. <laughs> so always let us know like questions you have, ideas you have, like fun projects you wanna work out. We're always here for that. Yeah, and just when you were saying that, Larissa, I was thinking like one of the things that our multi-farm CSA did, again, it was umbrellaed under a local nonprofit. Um, so they kind of had like the staff capacity and some connections, but it could be a role for ASAP to actually just find um, local, uh, like more, not corporate sponsors or just like local businesses that would want to sponsor a share or two or whatever. And then ASAP could, um, you know, help get those funds out to farms who are offering, you know, who have like a mission to offer cost shares. Um, I don't know, that could be another potential role that ASAP could take to really beat the streets and talk to local businesses or breweries or restaurants or, you know, whatever that want to sort of get their name out there as like having this food, food access, um, you know, initiative, so. Yeah, yeah, we did. So we're wrapping up our Appalachian Farms Feeding Families program, which maybe some folks on this call were part of that, but we had some COVID response grant funding to um, pay farmers specifically to sell to food pantries and food relief sites. And the food relief sites got to ask for exactly what they wanted coming in and it fostered all these great relationships. And the funding is running up and we have these really great partnerships in place and folks that are really committed to now sourcing locally because it's such a game changer when you don't have to depend on mana. And to Mark's point, like you're not getting the leftovers, you're getting mm -hmm. like food that was grown for you specifically. Um, and so with that program wrapping up, we're having lots of conversations about what it looks like to continue fostering these coalitions and really advocating for this work on a bigger scale and like what role we can play to put like infuse some more funds into the region for food that is feeding the people of our communities. And we've been thinking about it a lot in the um, food pantry model and food relief site model, but maybe not so much in the CSA model. So this could be a really great opportunity for us to start exploring with this group and other CSA farmers, like what would it look like to transition it into something like that? You know, because it's not like folks are, what we've said today, you know, ever since COVID, like it's not like the funding is stopping, like people's hearts are definitely opened up to the need and it's only getting more and more exacerbated. So what does it look like to transition that to something that is working with your businesses and in your profitable models um, is something we're always keen to and like what it looks like for us to just provide even the support around fundraising um, support, like Mark's like, we're not fundraisers, we don't think, but hey, maybe. And you know, what would it look like for us to help put something on for y'all or um, materials, like take off some of the, the work from like creating infographics and advertising and like the social media graphics and things like that. Like all of these are ideas I wanna incept in your brains because I want y'all to continue being these awesome thought partners that you are. And like, I can only, do as much as you know you're feeling me to do. So give me the ideas and let's see what we can create. 
Any last thoughts before we close? I'm so grateful for everyone here. Thank you, Hedge Family Farm. Thanks, Wests. Thanks, Mary Carol. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Anna. I'm going to drop in here our quick, very quick survey that's always super helpful for having these things. Um, and then I have the recordings, which is now truncated because I popped off in the middle. So those secrets will stay with you all forever. But uh, I'll share that out. I'm going to look into some of these pieces and get back to everyone. Um, so yeah, keep keep connected. Let me know anything that ASAP can ever do to support y'all. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Larissa. Thanks, everybody. Good night, y'all. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night.